there are precisely 17 different possible types of wallpaper. Uh, that is, 17 different types of symmetries that allow you to tile the plane in a periodic way like this one. And in this video, I'm going to tell you exactly what I mean by that, how in art around the world you can discover these types of symmetries for yourself, and even tell you about some brand new research on something called aperiodic tilings. Here are four ancient wallpapers, and each of the artwork is a little bit different, but what's also different about them is the type of symmetries they have. Reflections, rotations, translations, and each of these different wallpapers is given a different code. The two on the left here have the exact same code, and this is going to be because even though they have different artistic stylings, the symmetries that they have are exactly the same. Well, the ones on the right are different types of symmetries and they get different codes. All of these beautiful wallpapers came from Alhambra, which is an Islamic era fortress, and it turns out that it has nearly every one of the 17 possible wallpapers. So what do I mean by symmetries? The first symmetry we're going to talk about is translational symmetry. If I have a symbol like pi, I can imagine translating it and I get another copy of the symbol pi. I also could talk about reflections over a mirror. If I have a symbol like pi, then I could consider what its mirror images reflected over this line of symmetry. There's also another really cool one called glide reflections. It's kind of like a mirror reflection. You reflect over this line of symmetry, but then you glide down the line of symmetry and you have sort of two things at once, this gliding as well as this reflection. My favorite example of this is just footprints walking in the sand, left, right, left, right, left, right, and so forth. A left and right footprint is approximately a mirror image of each other, but glided forward. I could also have rotations. If I take my pi and I have a center rotation, I could rotate, for example, 180 degrees around that center point. One of my favorite examples of something with symmetry to do with rotations is the Isle of Man flag with this cool three legs. If I put a darker copy of it, I can rotate once, I get exactly the same thing. I can rotate twice and I can rotate three times and every time I get exactly back to where I was at the beginning. This has threefold rotational symmetry, so every rotation by 360 divided by three, which is 120 degrees, takes me exactly back to where I started. Okay, so those are the different types of symmetries that we're going to consider. And now if I open up a wallpaper like this, I want to think about the symmetries that are involved here. The first thing I'm going to demand for every single one of these wallpapers is a translational symmetry. If I put up a little box like this box here, I can think of the wallpaper as just multiple copies of that box over and over and over again. That is, we're talking about periodic tilings where there's one basic image that's copied over and over and over again. This wallpaper, by the way, is on a municipal building in Prague, and I'd really encourage you to pause the video here, take a look at this, and try to figure out what of all the type of symmetries that I've mentioned does it have. For example, consider this line that cuts right down the center. This is a mirror. On the left and the right is just a mirror image of it. Okay, well, what else does it have? It also has a really cool glide reflection axis. Let me take this basic cell that I have, and I'm going to do the mirror image of it. Now you'll notice that the thing inside of the black doesn't align up neatly, but if I glide it off to the side, now it does. So this yellow line is a glide reflection axis perpendicular to the mirror reflection axis. There's also a bunch of rotational symmetries in this particular wallpaper. Uh, for example, consider this spot at the top. I'm going to denote this point with a diamond, and a diamond in this video is always going to represent two-fold or 180 degree rotational symmetries. Because if I rotate around that point, well, I get to precisely the same thing. I have a two-fold rotational symmetry here. I'll record this down as a rotation of order two because it is two-fold or 180 degree rotational symmetry. But this is not the only rotation that it has. In fact, every single one of these other diamonds has order two rotational symmetry. You can sort of pause and try to imagine rotating those in your mind. However, a note that four of them I've colored green and two of them I've colored blue. And really, of these six different rotation centers, I think that there's only really two of them. Let me show you what I mean. If I take this and I translate it down, then the rotation centers at the top have now become the rotation centers at the bottom. That is, the top ones and the bottom ones really are the same under this translational symmetry that we've already established. 
And likewise, if I use the glide reflection business, the left one glides over to the right one. And the same is true for the blue. Under the glide reflections, the left one goes to the blue one. So of these sort of six spots that I observe in the cell, I think there's only two that are fundamentally different. And so this type of wallpaper, this one that's given this code PMG, M here stands for mirror, by the way, G here stands for glide, and P stands for primitive, which I'll talk about a little bit later. But the point is that things of the PMG classification always have this particular pattern of a mirror reflection, a glide reflection, and two different distinct rotational centers of order two. I could re-raw the details of this particular thing. It doesn't have to look visually this way. It have different colors, different designs. But it's the symmetries that I am identifying under this code PMG. Now, in this example, the sort of primitive cell that I was copying over and over again was a rectangle. But that's not the only possibility. For example, in this one, this is some Persian glazed tile, that what you're gonna experience is actually a rhombus, and that is the basic primitive tile that's translated all the way around the wallpaper. Now, one of the things we want to consider is why are there only 17 of these? And part of the way to deal with this is let's just think about the vertexes of these different cells. What are the possibilities there? So if I just look at the points, we have what's called a lattice. It's just a different points. And remember, our rule is that we have to have translational symmetry. If I put a little rectangle here to emphasize the rectangular nature of this lattice, I can translate it around and it just gives me different copies of the lattice. And so then the question is like, well, what possible lattices are there that have this translational symmetry? And it turns out there are only five basic lattices. I haven't put any other details of my wallpaper sketching in at all, but in terms of the underlying lattices, there are only five. Here's rectangular ones. Then I also have square ones, which kind of look like a rectangular one, but notice that the rotational symmetries are different. For squares, any rotation by 90 degrees looks the same, but for a rectangle, the rotation by 90 degrees is now oriented differently. I could also have a rhombic lattice. Rhombic lattices are kind of cool. They just look like a rectangle again, but now there's an extra point in the center of them. I have a triangular or hexagonal one. So this one, sort of depending on how I want to think about it, you could either see it as having a bunch of triangles, or you can think about it having a bunch of hexagons. And the difference between these triangles and hexagons, when I fill in the details with specific wallpapers, is gonna have different types of symmetries, but the underlying lattice here can be thought of in either way. This is not tilted with the regularity that allows a hexagons to form, so it is truly something different. This is called an oblique lattice. So it turns out that from these five basic lattices with their translational symmetries, different choices that you make about how you fill it in can affect the amount of rotation, the amount of mirrors, the amount of glide reflections in it. And it gets this list of 17 different possible ones. The numbers here, like one, two, three, and six, all refer to the order of the rotations. For example, P6 means it has six-fold rotational symmetry, as you get with lots of hexagons. And then the M stands for mirror, the G stands for glide, and then there's this distinction between a primitive cell with P and C, which is gonna stand for face-centered cell. I'm gonna show you that in a minute. So we've already seen PMG. Let's just take a look at a couple of the other possibilities. The very simplest one is called just P1. This, by the way, is a medieval era wallpaper. And if you notice this, I have a translational symmetry. This little flower is repeated over and over, but that's it. There's nothing else. There's no mirrors, there's no glides, there's no rotations. Any attempt to make this different is gonna change it. So the only thing I can do is simply translate it. I also have this next one, which I will call P2. This came from an Egyptian tomb. The basic primitive cell here is a square. So this is based out of a square lattice. And from here, I notice there's a lot of different rotational centers. So for example, let's take the one directly in the center. If I rotate by 180 degrees in the center, I get to, well, exactly the same thing. Likewise, if I go to the edge here, okay, another spot. If I rotate around that spot now, I get to exactly the same thing. And I actually think that there's two spots that are really the same. So that is these center points on the vertical axes. If I just translate over, well, they're just the same spot under translation. So I'll color code blue for the first, green for the second. 
I also have a few other ones, each of the corners, which are the same under translation, I can reflect around. And likewise, the top and the bottom midpoints, I can reflect around those. Again, the same under translational symmetries. And so what do I get? Four rotation centers of order two. No mirrors, no glides. This is referred to as P2. Okay, this next one is a lot of fun. I'm gonna give you a hint. It's already P6, so six-fold rotational symmetry here. And that occurs up in these cute little flowers that we have at the top. I can rotate once, twice, three times, four times, five times, and six times, and get back to exactly where I started. And in fact, all four corner points of my rhombus are gonna have that same six-fold rotational symmetry. What's pretty cool here is that there's lots of other points that don't have six-fold rotational symmetry. For example, consider this point. Instead of a hexagon for six-fold rotational symmetry, this little marker, I'll make a triangle for three-fold rotational symmetry. And indeed, if I rotate 120 degrees, I get to exactly the same thing. If I rotate 120 degrees again, it's again a copy and all the way back. So this has three-fold rotational symmetry at this point. Then there's a bunch of spots like this one. I would put a diamond here for two-fold rotational symmetry. And indeed, if I rotate that by 180 degrees, I get to exactly the same thing. So in total, I have one rotational center of order six, the four different corner points. I think of them all the same under translation. I then have two different rotation centers of order three. Note that there's no glide reflections, no mirror reflections here. So these two different triangles, I really want to think of them as actually different inside of the cell. So I say two rotation centers of order three. I then look at all of the different spots with order two rotations. And even though I have five of them drawn in pink, I really think there's three of them that are fundamentally different. There's the one in the center, which will never be the ones on the outside. And then on the two parallel sides, those are gonna be the same by translation. And the other two parallel sides are gonna be the same by translation. So that gives me a total of three distinct ones. And so this particular type of wallpaper, this P6, this thing that has degree six rotational symmetry is always gonna come along with this pattern of having two other rotation centers of order three and three other rotation centers of order two. You can get rid of all of the artwork here and come up with sort of this nice cell diagram is what we call it. This is the basic structure behind what's happening. And then an artist can fill in the details here with, well, whatever sort of detailing that they would like to have. But all of these symmetries have to be obeyed for it to be P6. Let me show you one more before I turn to some software that's let us do all of the possible 17 groups all at once. This is a kind of funky one. The first glance at it is that you might notice there's no spots where rotations work out nicely. Any spot you try to have a nice rotation fails. But there's a lot of interesting mirrors occurring. For example, all three of these pink ones are mirror reflections, and there's more than I've just listed here. But there's also glide reflections. And unlike my first example, the glide reflection axes are now parallel to the mirror reflection axes. What's kind of interesting about this is this is called CM, and I had indicated that first C stands for face-centered. And basically the idea here is that if I try to think about what the basic cell is, well, the basic cell looks like this sort of rhombus. And one of the features it has is that these mirror and glide reflection axes are not aligned with the boundaries of my primitive cell. They're straight up and down, but the boundaries are off at an angle. This is one of the fundamental features of this wallpaper with code CM. To help us visualize all 17 at the same time, I have a lovely applet, which I'll put down in the description. And what I'm gonna do is just start by putting any sort of interesting shape here. And so we can just kind of click through what happens when I add glides, when I add mirrors, when I added the face-centered mirrors, when I rotate with order two, when I add lots of glides, when I have lots of mirrors, all of the different options as I go down the list. So for example, this one is the P6 that we've seen earlier. If I do P6M, it's gonna get a lot more complicated because it has all the things from P6, but also has a mirror in it. Now you might've noticed that we had rotations of order two, three, four, and six, but nothing else. Why was there no P5, no P7? Now it turns out that none of these are possible. Imagine you have some lattice, and I just identified two of the points on the lattice, a yellow one that's gonna be my center point of rotation, and then just some other point. Let's consider how about an order eight rotation. So 360 divided by eight is 45 degrees. 
If I rotate this point by 45 degrees, I get another point. And so if my broad lattice is going to be able to be rotated by 45 degrees, this second pink point must also be somewhere on the lattice. And I can do this, rotating by 45 degrees over and over and over again as much as I wish until I've created a little octagon. That is, if you're allowing ordinary rotations, then that must mean that you have these kind of octagons appearing in your lattice. But now let's consider translations. But for example, I have this arrow here that goes between two points. And since a lattice allows any point to be translated to any other point, the one in the center must also have a similar arrow, and that's going to create a new point that must be on the lattice if indeed I can do these translations and take any lattice point to any other lattice point by translation. And then I can repeat that argument. So if I just keep on going around the outside of the octagon, but then translating the center point in the same way with the same translation, I keep getting new points. And keeping on going with this pattern, what I've created is actually an entirely new octagon. A smaller octagon than the original octagon that I began with. And this is a problem. Because if I can take a larger octagon and create a smaller octagon demanding those translational symmetries, then I could do it again. I'd make a smaller octagon, a smaller octagon, a smaller octagon. That is, if you kept going with this argument, the points in the lattice would have to be arbitrarily close together as I can make arbitrarily smaller and smaller octagons. And by definition of a lattice, we assume that this is discrete, that our points stay a fixed minimal distance away from each other. And so there are no rotational symmetries of a lattice of order eight. And by the same sort of basic arguments, you can show this is true for five and seven and everything bigger than eight as well. Something like order four rotations, which make a square fail this argument, because the square that you get doing this is exactly the same size as what you began with, this contraction argument doesn't apply. Now, I've really been focusing on periodic tilings, where you take, like, say, a rectangle and you copy it over and over across the plane. However, there's a whole other field of research that studies aperiodic tilings, and the question is, can you take a few different shapes, maybe of different sizes, so they still tile the plane, but there's never periodicity, there's never this pattern that repeats over and over and over again. And what has just been released in a new paper is a bizarre shape called the hat, which is an aperiodic monotile. That is, you can put these shapes together so it does tile the plane, but it is never going to repeat. There's never a periodicity to it. And the recency of this result just shows how cool the idea of tiling a plane really can be. I will put a link down in the description to that. Now, if you want to learn more about tilings and all sorts of other cool math stuff, then I highly recommend the sponsor of today's video, which is Brilliant.org. Brilliant is an online learning platform, and they have thousands of lessons, but I think you might really enjoy this course called Beautiful Geometry. There are all sorts of other cool types of tilings beyond the ones that I talked about in this video, like semi-regular tilings that use multiple polygons to tile the plane, or these dihedral tilings where you allow the tiles to be of different size. What I really love about Brilliant is just how interactive they are. You're always testing your knowledge, getting explanations, and the lessons are full of beautiful animations that you can control. As a math professor, I know that this kind of active, student-centered learning is highly effective, and this is why I'm so proud to be sponsored by Brilliant. To try everything that Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, go to brilliant.org slash Trevor Bazzett, or click the link down in the description, and the first 200 of you to click that link will get an additional 20% off an annual premium subscription. With that said, if you have any questions, leave them down in the comments below, and we'll do some more math in the next video.